Ms. Watlington is unable to join us today, and Ms. Ashmera is 
in the elevator, so she will be here momentarily. Uh, but we will go ahead while we wait for her and start with introductions. Uh, we'll start over to my left with our guest. If you just want to tell us uh, who you are and who you were, what organization you're with. What is CMPD? Sandy Dulles, Rebecca Stoll, CMPD. Sandy Dulles, Rebecca Stoll, CMPD. Eric Hazel, City Manager, South Africa. Rebecca Hefner, Innovation and Technology. Menzo, Charlotte Observer. Ryan Devine, Wilmington, Charlotte Hopkins. The Bros. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Kelly Blackwell, CMPD. Thanks. Paul Paskoff, CMPD. Charles Smith, CMPD. Julia Martin, City Manager's Office. Angela Charles, Assistant City Manager. Uh, Willie Ratch for Community Relations. Dimple Ajmera, Committee Member. Larkin Eggleston, Committee Chair. James Mitchell, Vice Chair. Renee Johnson, Committee Men Member. Uh, Braxton Winston, uh, Council Member at Large. Bernard Miller, Community Relations. Jordan Pass, Strategy Advisor. Perfect, thank you guys. So one thing we're gonna add to the beginning of the agenda that you, is not on the one in front of you, but real quickly, everybody should have at their place a Safe Communities 2020 committee meeting schedule. Um, if everybody wants to take a look at this, we can actually approve it at the end of the meeting in case you want to cross check. Um, we did note that in March and November, we'll be meeting on the first Tuesday of the month at noon. Um, the rooms might vary, but first Tuesday of the month at noon, on a regular basis, this meeting today was, uh, mm -hmm off of that cycle because the mayor wanted us to get one in in January so we could get started on this framework uh, work that we're going to be doing over the next two meetings. But um, we will have lunch because, you know, Smudgy and I, Thank chair, you. chair and vice chair campaign, Thank you. our committee, there's got to be food. <laughs> got to be food. Uh, but also noted that March and November uh, are election days and we might have to adjust those meetings as needed for that. Um, and then no meetings in July and August. So take a look at that as you have a chance, and we can approve that at the end of the meeting. Wanted to, um, Ms. Charles, was there anything you wanted to go over with agenda-wise before we talk about the referral from the mayor? Uh, sure. Um, good, good morning, uh, Chairman Eggleston, Vice Chair Mitchell, and members of the Safe Communities uh, Committee. We do have an exciting agenda for you today. Um, staff will, after the referral from the mayor is discussed, uh, staff will uh, review uh, briefly the framework or the, the evidence-based framework presentation that was done earlier to reduce uh, violence. And then after that, uh, Willie Ratchford will lead us and facilitate us through, uh, through a discussion to get us to the 60-day point and, and come up with a plan for the group. So that's it. Thank you. So everybody's got in front of them as well, um, policy topic referral to city council committee. I don't usually read things that you're looking at, but I will in this case, we make sure all of our guests um, are able to hear this as well. On January 6th to our committee, Mayor Vi Lyles um, sent this referral. Description background, Charlotte's one of the fastest growing cities in the nation, currently 16th most populated city in the country. In 2019, homicide counts in Charlotte were the highest since 93. At the request of city leaders with the assistance of resources provided by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Johns Hopkins <coughs> University. Oh, oh, excuse me. Oh. <laughs> don't, don't, don't mix lives here so much. <laughs> Johns Hopkins University Center for Government Excellence cross-departmental team was formed to use research and data to inform violence reduction strategy. And currently, multiple strategies in progress, including county-led efforts to share information and practices around violent reduction. Health Director Gibby Harris provided a community violence overview to the Board of County Commissioners defining violence as a public health concern and recommended the development of a community-wide comprehensive strategy to address all forms of violence. The policy question uh, that we're being asked is how does the city ensure that strategies and programs reduce violence? And our charge is that we should establish an evidence-based framework to reduce violence in our community with an assessment of current city programs as well as programs in benchmark cities. This is the first step towards a strategic process and the time frame for developing this framework is 60 days. So essentially between today's meeting um, where the goal is going to be to kind of level set, we've got some folks who are new to council, we've got a lot of us that are, are new to this committee um, and obviously this committee was just recently reestablished as a standalone committee. So we wanna make sure that we're all starting on the same page um, but the goal between this meeting 
and then for us to complete at our February meeting, which is only, I guess, about two weeks away, uh, would be to establish this framework. The framework being essentially what do we want to measure and how do we want to measure it. And from there, we'll determine beyond that um, what strategies we have that work, which ones we have that don't, and what other cities are doing that we might want to replicate. Um, or if there's things that we're doing that we want to expand. But we want to know what our end objectives are first uh, and then work backwards to determine how, how do we get there. So the framework will be that, um, that what, are we, what do we want to measure and how do we want to measure it. Uh, and we'll start that today um, with a bit of a highlight reel from what we got at the strategy session, I guess, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, however long that was. And, um, and then really hone in on, and you've got the deck in front of you, I believe. We'll really hone in on, probably a different page on mine, slide 11, which are the building blocks for violence reduction and what, making sure that we believe that that captures all of the things that we want to be the building blocks uh, of this framework and of this strategy uh, so that staff can bring back to us some recommendations in two weeks for that February meeting and we can really, um, and the hope would be that we would be able to send to council that framework after that committee meeting for approval, bring it back here and then start to analyze the, the strategies we want to implement or not. I think that captures it, Ms. Charles. It does, it does. So we will start with Chief Putney. He's gonna say a few words and then Rebecca and Sarah are gonna come up. What do you want me at the podium or here? Why don't you sit at the desk? Hmm. You're part of the team. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. I've been told to keep it to a minute and a half, so 90 oh. seconds on my time starts now. No, briefly, I think this is a, a tremendous opportunity. Um, we've been talking about all year, hearing about the violence, in particular the homicides, but violent crime was up as well. Um, and I think if we really want to wrap our hands around it and have, I'm not going to need that, but and, and uh, have a, a long-term solution, now is the time. Uh, back in 1993, I remember when we were worried about the homicide rate then, and I also remember there were a lot of uh, strategies that were discussed, but I also know uh, now in 2019, based on what we saw then, they weren't maintained. I would hope that uh, page 11 is our guide. And from page 11, not really to get ahead, but I like to keep things as concise as possible. That's the building blocks, and it's the foundation of what we're trying to build long term. Um, everything that I see on page 11 resonates with what we're trying to do strategically from an evidence-based approach that we do not just for 2020, but for the next 10 years. Uh, and I'm serious about that. If we're consistent in investing and holding each other accountable around those outcomes, and the outcomes are pretty, pretty consistent in my mind. I measure anybody that I work with around whether or not um, young people are reading and doing math on grade level, whether or not you impact uh, the attendance rate, meaning if you're in school, you're learning. If you're not, obviously, if you're not in school, you're not learning. Um, and then the other piece is um, reducing behavioral issues so that we can lastly prevent crime. It's just that simple. Every community organization that's doing work with us, that's how we measure them. And we see results, fantastic results. In one semester at Mountain Island uh, Elementary School, one of our community organizations increased the grades by 40% in those in that cohort, reduced attendance issues, absenteeism by about 30%, about a third. And um, when I went out to the graduation, it was the most excited I've seen young people in school in a long time. Uh, now, we'll get excited for sporting events, but this is about academics and achievement. That's the long-term vision. That's what I think page 11 is the basis for. We do need your guidance around what's missing there and whether or not we're on track. I can tell you based on the outcomes I've seen, especially over the last two years, with the organizations that get it right, um, it pays dividends. We're not worried about the homicide rate. We're talking about lives that have been saved. We're not worried I, about the I think homicide I went rate. over. I think I went over my time. That's okay. Yeah, uh, we're not worried about. We're, we're not. We are worried about the homicide rate. We're not going to dwell on the homicide rate because 
there's other things that we've got to impact if we want sure. the end result to be a lowering of violent crime. What I'll tell you is we don't have to worry about what we prevent. That's what I mean. Yes, the homicide rate, everybody talks about it. Mm -hmm. And I think relative to where we compare across the country, we're still in decent shape. But it's not what we want. It's not satisfactory to us. But I will tell you, we don't worry about what we prevent because that's a success. People still alive is what we should count. And this, I think, is the foundation of how we get there. Chief, I'll ask you to, to stay with us, as I'm sure people are going to have questions either now or later, if, uh, if that's all right. Yes, sir. I'll be right here. <laughs> <laughs> I meant stay at the table so you don't have to keep coming back and forth. Yes, sir. Um, Ms. Charles, do we want to invite up our presenters? Yes. Uh, Sarah and Rebecca. Y'all can do podium or table, whatever you're more comfortable with. Get two seats right here if that works best for you. Okay. <clears throat> So I'm uh, Rebecca Hefner with the city's Innovation and Technology Department. And uh, as um, uh, Councilmember Eggleston said, we're just doing the highlight reel. Uh, I'm going to move through the slides pretty quickly. This is uh, um, to review key points um, from the presentation that was given at the strategy session especially as it relates to the programs, the review that we did of evidence-based programs, of the city's programs, and best practices from some cities around the country, because it's that review that really got us to those uh, potential building blocks um, that you all will be talking about. So um, I'm not gonna recap all of these key pieces, but uh, I think the key thing to think about here is that as we talk about page 11 and the building blocks that we're looking at a comprehensive approach and that violence is recognized as a public health issue um, and that means that we're talking about exposure to a variety of risk factors so how are we going to look at addressing those things um, some of the other key pieces to remember is that um, this work is being done uh, not only here um, with you guys as a city council, but these conversations are happening um, with other community partners, um, with the county, and so this timing right now to have an integrated approach to really thinking about violence as a public health issue um, is, is spot on. And so uh, as we recap some of these key points, this is really about how we think collaboratively, holistically, much more bigger picture um, than only policing, but policing obviously being a very important component. There's a lot to unpack on this slide. Um, I think uh, Council Member Johnson gave, gave a uh, really good summary of it in our, uh, your discussion at the strategy session is this is, when you think about a public health approach and understanding risk factors, this is all about trauma. So it's uh, exposure to different kinds of trauma at different levels uh, and, and um, then building resilience in children and families and in communities uh, is, is a part of the uh, approach to violence reduction. So when we took a look at what was happening across the country, we looked at uh, evidence-based programs, we looked at peer city practices, and we looked at what Charlotte's doing and how it relates to those things. Um, there are many specific evidence-based programs for violence reduction. When we looked at what's happening here in Charlotte-Mecklenburg, we really identified this kind of violence interruption program as a model that was a potential gap in Charlotte. Uh, a lot of 
a lot of the um, youth prevention programs are, are um, here in the community, a lot of justice-involved intervention programs that particularly the county um, manages those practices. We have evidence-based policing strategies, um, but a lot, of, a lot of cities across the country um, are implementing violence interruption programs, and that is an evidence-based model. So we identified that as a potential gap. We also looked just at best practices across the nation, understanding that um, today's innovation may be tomorrow's evidence-based program, that the, you don't, you don't want to just stick with what's evidence-based, although it's a great start. Um, you can also look at what are the components of an evidence-based program and how might you implement those in a new context uh, to, um, to create a best practice. And then the question is, how do you evaluate that so that it becomes evidence-based. Across the country, what we're seeing is um, best practices include broad collaborative partnerships, true community voice and agency, the use of data and evidence, uh, youth engagement, strong police community relations, uh, focus on systemic issues and root causes. So when you think back to those multi-level risk factors, you're really thinking about systemic issues and root causes. Uh, public health violence and eruption program, and of course community will. And we're in a great place right now with uh, um, a lot of attention being paid and a lot of groups thinking about how can we work together to reduce violence. Ms. Hefner, before you leave this slide, Mr. Mitchell has a question. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you share with us, because I, I just want to make sure we compare as apples to apples and we talking about best practice from other cities. Can you give examples what cities <laughs> did we look at and have you repeated at the retreat, I apologize, I missed this part. So the, uh, some of the cities we looked at included uh, Oakland, Chicago, Atlanta, New York City, New Orleans, um, Milwaukee, thank you, and Minneapolis. And um, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Um, and of course, there's there's plenty of other places to look at. Um, what we were doing with with that scan um, was trying to get a sense of places that where where they're having great success. Um, um, like Oakland, for example, to understand what's happening there, and then in some places you know, where you wouldn't, you don't think of them as being uh, cities that are having great success, but we we can see that they're having success in kind of narrowly focused areas, um, like Chicago with particular neighborhoods, for example, and so trying to trying to do a, a general scan. Now, there's lots of other cities and um, that we can take a look at, but this also incorporates. Um, the, you know, uh, the research that's been done by um, you know, entities who already have scanned and said, you know, we, we see these as best practices. Um, for example, the, the report that the uh, mayor shared at the strategy session, you see a lot of these same items listed in there. Um, but this is also a, an, uh, a pulling together of what we were seeing from those different cities. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then we started this scan of how, you know, what are we doing here in Charlotte? What kind of specific programs and strategies are we implementing, both that are directly focused on violence reduction and also those that are indirectly focused on violence reduction, meaning that they may have an opportunity to impact uh, violence reduction, but they have an, a different primary goal. So housing programs, for example, the, the primary goal there is around um, providing stable housing, but there may be an opportunity by uh, working across programs to also impact violence reduction through those sorts of strategies. And uh, um, there's also the handout which had much more information on each of these programs and some others. Um, that was our initial scan, 
this provides both some information on where, you know, where we already have an evidence base, uh, where there might be some gaps, but also just a way to think uh, broadly about the different kinds of programs that the city implements that um, could be layered and work together kind of through those building blocks. And I'll pass it back to Sarah. So um, the, I guess the key takeaways, and the city manager touched on this at the strategy session, is that we're doing a lot of things right. Um, there is room to, uh, to build on what we're doing and also to do thorough evaluation, and to Chief's point, over time um, of the work that we're doing. Um, and specifically to intentionally shift aspects either of the way we run our programs or the programs that we fund, for example, to achieve specific goals if we, if we outline them correctly. Um, from the research that we did, uh, we did identify that a violence interruption model could be a gap, so that's one of the other key takeaways. But ultimately, that information sharing, um, data sharing, and collaboration is is critical to all of this work, not only within our own departments, but um, between agencies and organizations. So um, we do intend to continue this conversation about how we greater collaborate, and I'm sure that you will continue that conversation as well. Uh, that's how we will be more sustainable. All right, guys. Second question. Ms. Ashmara. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So if you go to slide number eight, um, and you have youth programs there, uh, so is the plan to look at some, or, or have some sort of metrics for some of this youth program to see how we are preventing, um, cr uh, how we are preventing crime? So I don't, okay. <laughs> okay. So currently it's not being measured in terms of how it's really making a difference? No, it is being measured. It is being measured. Yes, ma'am. Because I've seen under evidence-based, it doesn't say yes. Yes, um, it, it does say yes. There's just an asterisk talking about it's a local evaluation. Uh, UNC Charlotte has been a part of our work here. We haven't had a, an external partner come out beyond that uh -huh. because 90% of the people who engage in those programs don't commit further crime which is a goal. I told you the four things that we look at, that okay. is the big one. So what we know is we're changing behavior. Uh, we're increasing people's likelihood for success in uh, elementary school up through high school, um, and we're preventing crime. So uh, we know based on our measures that we're getting those outcomes that we talked about earlier. Okay, so uh, th this is where I'm trying to get a clarification on. So. Explain me what's the difference between yeah. best practice and evidence-based. I get it, the best practice yeah. is what the, what the recommendations are from all the research and so on, but how do you come to evidence-based? We, we wrestled with the language on that, and I, I didn't really, it's a bit ambiguous. Okay. And, and so I agree with you that it's, and I, I'm interested to hear y'all's take on it again, but um, I pushed back on this some and said, well, what does, what does something have to be to be a best practice? or what is the level of validation that or study that has to be done on something for it to be evidence based and i don't i don't know that that's particularly black and white but i think that the idea was that the evidence based has been more Do more deeply vetted or more deeply kind of proven out um with statistics where the best practice might be more anecdotal yeah, evidence okay. of success um if y'all so i i guess i'm i'm trying to understand if we are investing in programs, right, uh, based on ba best practices, that, is it really helping us move needle in the right direction, right? Uh, or are there any other programs that we have not tapped into because of resources that are limited? What could lead us to evidence-based uh, and help us move needle in the right direction? So you have a couple of options when it comes uh, when it comes to that. So. An evidence-based program is actually a, a very specific kind of program. It is, it is one that has been rigor, rigorously evaluated in multiple settings um, with um, you know, 
peer review of the methodology and uh, shown to be effective. And it has an, um, a, a structured implementation that you can take from one place to another. It doesn't, it doesn't mean you would have to do every, every piece of it the same way. You can adapt based on local context, but, there, but it is a structured program. And so, so to be evidence, an evidence-based program, you have to meet, meet those criteria. And there are a number of um, kind of clearinghouse organizations that vet all the evaluations and um, you know, identify what outcome of interest it, um, the program applies to. And that's the, you know, the, the previous slide where we talked about you know, what, are, what are the range of evidence-based programs related to violence reduction. So, uh, crime prevention through environmental design, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand that. What, what does that mean? All right. Um, the SEPTED model shows that you go in and you evaluate all things that might contribute to disorder and crime. Um, uh, the easiest example is um, um, if you have a, it's, it's connected to nuisance abatement. You have one particular business that's causing you a lot of issues. There are a lot of environmental problems with it. There's a accumulation of, of um, trash. There's um, petty crime that's happening, uh -huh. and then it uh, decreases the value in the area. So what we do is comprehensively go in um, from an enforcement end. We deal with the crime, but we have other partners, code enforcement and others, that come in and weigh in on that problem to, to change the behavior, to change the image, to to increase the value of the property in particular and thus reduce crime and prevent it in the future. That's the concept. Got it. Thank you. I'm good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Winston and then Mr. Mitchell. Thank you. Um, just wanted to kind of kind of clarify what is our end goal here. Um, definitely believe evidence-based approaches are, are necessary and an integral part um, into the, the grander scheme of things, but um, also fear, fearful that if we put all our eggs into that basket, that it becomes very academic, you know, it becomes very um, too pragmatic in the, in the sense that it doesn't give you the ability um, to be flexible. It also, I also um, fear that we might give up on some of those um, less evidence-based approaches that we might feel, for instance, um, something that I've heard uh, Mr. Mitchell talk about bringing the CIAA here, right? That it's, you can't really measure bringing these 13 black schools to certain populations and presenting them with pathways forward. You know, losing that, we can't necessarily quantify that impact on a certain section, but we know <laughs> and, 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 and we want to economically develop in a way that puts those types of, so will we abandon those things based on, or, or kind of put those things to the, to the side? No. Ultimately, what are we trying to achieve here in terms of the, the mix of these things? I would say from my vantage point, no. We, this is not, A, I think you said, what is the end goal that we're, we're looking to achieve? And I think that is what today's meeting and February's meeting, that's part of the framework that we are being charged with creating is, the framework is where, what do we want to measure? Okay. What do we want to achieve and how do we measure it? So that's the question we, that's, that's posed to us that we have to answer. But I would say that, that evidence-based is not, uh, do it mutually exclusive from some of the things that anecdotally we know are effective or some of the things that build stronger communities or build stronger relations between the government, the police, whoever, and the community. Uh, I think it's going to be an all the above approach. So the, you know, we are not just saying, okay, well, on this slide number eight, the top three stay and the rest of them go. I think we continue to invest in those things, but some of those Maybe we haven't been measuring them as rigorously, but maybe some of them, even though we don't saying they're evidence based today, could they be? Is there a way for us to measure that and and bear out the results a little bit more in a way that says, you know, maybe the mayor's youth employment program is working, but how have we shown that it's working, and yeah. how can we measure that it's working? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, thank you, sir. You you made my point. I think it's both and. Um, if you, all you're looking at is evidence-based, then you're going to have to take years to validate, to verify, and then the portability is why we put a lot into evidence-based. Best practices, though, are the right things to do. 
that still get you those foundational blocks as outcomes. So if, um, you know, the last study says you can do three things and you got a 92% chance of escaping poverty, right? You graduate high school, you get a full-time job, and you delay having kids. Um, I can attest to that third one uh, <laughs> tremendously. But, but the truth is, it is an absolute fact, 92%. Our issue around employment and everything else is interconnected, so is the uh, desire to fight crime. So we might do things, to your point, that are innovative and we think best practice is the right thing to do, and then later we study them to show that there's evidence in its face and can be portable to other cities. That's kind of how it works. That's why you'll see a lot of best practices, because we're going to do what we think is right, and then we'll prove it to you via science down the road. I think if we're serious about fighting crime, that's the best approach is both and to your point, sir. And not only portable from here to Raleigh or to D.C. or to wherever, but I think, too, we might, as we get further down the road, this isn't necessarily a today or, or February discussion, but we might test something in one of our hot spots, you know, in Arrowwood and Nations Ford, and it might work really well. We might say, you know, I think that would work at Sugar Creek in 85. So. I think it's portable internally too, when we see something's working in one community yeah. and we see similarities between that community and another where there are challenges that we can, we can move it over there and easily implement it. Mr. Mitchell. And staff, you can keep the slide here, but uh, I just want to make reference to us, um, to committee member Councilman Winston, um, under the youth programs, Councilman Winston and I work with my brother's keepers and we have identified 54 other nonprofits are touching African American uh, men and uh, what we say boys of color. And so I do think, staff, we can give you that data because I do think this is where collaboration, our first box is so key. This is a problem for all of us to have skin in the game and solve. And, and secondly, as we get to the third box, invest in community led efforts. Some of the efforts are already underway. And I just think they just need maybe uh, the Jumpstart Michael Grant to make sure they can successful and be part of our solution as well. Uh, I totally agree. I'll, I'll tell you too. Um, um, I believe that this should not be just about city and county government exactly. funding in any way. Right. And if you go to that uh, slide that had the programs up there, mm -hmm. uh, many of them have transitioned to things that we were the catalyst mm -hmm. as a city. In funding initially now, the Envision Academy, um, the REACH Academy is underway uh, to being fully funded by pro private funding. So some of those programs that you're talking about, there's an opportunity if we get it right, and then we prove that it's evidence-based for uh, other funding sources that we can sustain it. Again, if we just do this for the next couple of years, um, we're wasting the effort because long-term is what we, we continue to fall short. Thanks, Chief. Ms. Hazel. I was, just, to say and then I, was, I was just going to say, you've already sort of teed up this particular mm -hmm. slide, so I might as well just mm -hmm. kind of highlight a couple things and then um, right. let you let me, continue. Let Ms. Johnson ask her question, then we'll dive into the building blocks. So you know that I'm new to council, so I, I don't know what our limits are as far as the committee, but is there anything to, to prohibit uh, community partners being a part of these meetings? When you talk about collaboration, representation matters. So if we bring someone who has their boots on the ground to, to be a part of the solution, also intergovernmental, uh, we have committees. If any issue is intergovernmental, this is. So if we brought somebody from the county or from CMS and from the community, then we're going to develop effective strategies. Um, just a thought, but I don't yeah. know what the city council committees, I don't know what the... Well, the this is a big are. room with a lot of chairs, and we'd love to have more of them filled. So, I mean, <laughs> I, we, we do thankfully have someone from uh, our friends at the county here today. Oh, and um, <laughs> so we've, we've got plenty of room, and we can, we can move into bigger rooms as necessary. So I, I want more people here. So I would say anybody that is, want, that is either currently or is wanting to be involved in this work, invite them to join us, invite them to bring their expertise. Kerr. Yes, sir. Uh, the other piece of that, ma'am, is accountability. So uh, with the Jumpstart grants, we're about to do fellows, and I think it would um, be in our best interest to then have them come in and report out to those measures as well. Okay. So then there's a level of accountability that also goes down to the, the grassroots. So I love the idea. I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Just um, navigating the politics might be a little bit more challenging, but I'm sure you're up to that too. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Hazel. 
Um, so we developed these building blocks to help um, shape your conversation based on the work um, that's already been done with the key component being this is, again, about um, a comprehensive and collaborative effort. Uh, during the strategy session, Chief Smith talked about the priority areas um, that, based on the data, um, have violent crime over time. So this first building block is about um, doing just what you were talking about um, and starting in some of those key priority areas, so working with partners across the city, across the county, um, partners who are already in the communities, and layering on work um, and doing that based on the local context of the area. The second building block, um, which we mentioned several times, is um, potentially identifying that gap of a violent interruption program and looking at how we could work with our partners um, to support the implementation of that program. Investing in community-led efforts, so great example, uh, like our Jumpstart micro grants. How do we do that? How do we do that strategically or do that more? Um, the chief mentioned uh, another potential program with um, fellows in the community, so that building block is really about um, understanding that community-led efforts are a critical component of addressing violence. And then um, how are we using data and evidence to ensure that, um, that the work is being effective, um, that we're measuring it over time, um, that we're using it to redirect um, components of our programs or um, the, the programs that we support. And then down below you'll see some expected outcomes if we focus on these building blocks. Um, and so. Uh, these are just some of the potential expected outcomes, but based on your conversation, um, you know, those can be shifted and then can help support staff identifying sort of what goes in each of these blocks in more detail. So I'll stop there and... Um, maybe maybe leave it on that slide, if you will. And, and Mr. Winston, I think to your question, the, the idea, as you stated, that last building block is use data and evidence, and so the evidence is often going to be from some of the programs, like you mentioned, evidence um, that something is working, even if it's not a, um, even if it's not, I mean, we're using evidence based as kind of saying that it's statistically been vetted, but I think that there, there are lots of kinds of evidence, and as you stated, we've seen evidence from some of the programs that we're not measuring as rigorously, but we know that there, there's effectiveness there. So, again, how do we take a brother's keeper and put some mm -hmm. you know, a framework around that to say how how can we more rigorously evaluate it so that we can show people it's working and that we can mm -hmm. justify expanding it and putting more dollars behind. Mm -hmm. right. So I think the the question and Angela jump in as, as needed um, here is do we have do we have these right and do we is this comprehensive of all of what we think are the building blocks for the framework. I think the, f the framework is something that we'll hone in on in the February meeting, but are we giving staff the right directive in saying that these are the building blocks, these are the outcomes? The, the contrast on the screen is hard there, but you can see it pretty clearly if you look in your printed copy. Um, violence reduction, healthier neighborhoods, increased access and awareness of youth and family programs and services, increased community capacity. Um, What's missing from that, or what do you think doesn't accu accurately reflect um, the guidance we want to give staff as they as they put something together to bring back to us in February to send that framework to council, Ms. Johnson? I think we want to have some intentionality around this. We've already identified four hot spots or so. We could we could connect those dots and bring that information um, to this approach. Also, uh, one of the evidence based approaches that we know works is peer support or peer led. So that's, I think, why perhaps that organization at that elementary school chief might be working. You may have a mentor in it. If it's the one I'm thinking, I don't know. If it's, but, if it's, but you may have someone that's walked in those shoes. So if we are intentional about those grassroots organizations and supporting organizations that are peer or experience led, so not only is that best practice, that's evidence-based, because evidence-based is a pro an approach. So evidence-based shows that peer-led or peer support 
works. So we could combine the, the two. So I think we need to be intentional about the areas that we're focused on and also the um, investment in community-led, peer-led efforts. Chief, would you or someone that you want to toss to want to give your two-minute description of what you envision the, the violence interruption program looking like in our community? I'd like to toss that, actually, but I'll take a stab at it. So truthfully, um, uh, Councilman, I, what we're doing is um, looking at the models that have worked and having people with credibility in those specific areas that come in while we're having um, a crisis, while we're having issues going on right now, who can then start the uh, conversation with community members who are inflamed right now to help de-escalate the situation. And then we follow up. Um, immediately to make sure we um, break up any potential retaliation. So it's, it's, it's hard to specifically tell you scientifically how that works because it's quite organic to the point that uh, uh, Councilman Winston was making. And, and we allow for that on both ways because you have credible people in the areas already. we got to expand that base to have more people do the work. But a lot of that work is, uh, to your point, ma'am, it's hard to quantify initially, but we know what it looks like because these people have credibility, who can defuse the situation, and then we can look to um, prevent uh, future violence by following through based on the information we get from those interrupters. Um, I've got Mr. Winston, and then I want to make sure I'm utilizing the best facilitator in the city of Charlotte, Mr. Ratchford. So um, get Mr. Winston's comment, and then uh, Mr. Ratchford, if you want to help us narrow our focus um, to our task today so we make sure we get people out of here on time, and now I will defer to you to facilitate. Mr. Winston. Um, so I just fear uh, that we as, as, a, as a council um, are going to look too myopically at the program level when we need to be at all times focusing on, on the higher the higher level of approach and, get, and giving staff the opportunity to work on the program level. Um, I don't see any kind of mention of overall policy change, right? We know that crime is a function of poverty and poverty is a function of a bad public policy. Um, so if we are focusing on trying to find the right program from a council perspective, I don't think that's the right place to go. If, for instance, the chief mentioned three things, right? Graduated high school, a job, or delaying having children, right? I think what should come from council is a broader um, approach of how do we change the systems that affect these people or these, these areas of these neighborhoods, right? So maybe it is something like, just taking for example these three things that the chief put out there, that um, we ensure that at 18 you're on the path to graduate high school, get a job, or go into the military or something like that. Um, then we give staff the opportunity to come up with the right programs, evidence-based programs, or, um, or, or best practices to achieve that. But I am fear if we, as council members, don't work from the higher level of what system we are trying to change, um, what policy, overarching policy that change that, that does affect every department within our organization, that we're not really going to we're going to be looking just to find a, a, a basket to put our eggs in and hold our hats on that, and that's not where we want to be. And I don't see that necessarily up here f f to guide us. I think that's, a, that's good for staff, but that's not necessarily where we need to be. Sorry. I'm not the chief's trying to. So uh, thank you, Mr. Eggleston and, and uh, Eggleston. Uh, and uh, Councilman, I, th I think you, you were right on target. Uh, th there are multiple levels in doing this work. Uh, this the hundred thousand foot level down to the grassroots, and 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 it is to the chief's point earlier. It is a both end. It's it's, it's not either or. So uh, I've been charged with uh, sort of trying to help you all in conversation, and so we need to hear from you all uh, about what should be the uh, deliverables as a result of this process. Uh, and three of the the, the deliverables are actually. Uh, contained in the charge from the, uh, the referral from the mayor. Uh, and those three are that uh, creation of an evidence-based 
framework to reduce violence in the community. And I think based on the conversation we've had and so far, we, we, we're starting to do that. Uh, an assessment of current uh, city programs, and uh, obviously we're doing that. And then thirdly, an assessment of uh, programs in benchmark cities. Uh, as you think about these three things, which will be included in whatever we come up with in 60 days, uh, we're also looking at these building blocks that uh, have been provided to you all. And we need to hear from you all. Uh, are we measuring the right things? Is, if, if you look at the outcomes, the expected outcomes at the bottom of the page, are those the right types of outcomes that, we'll, uh, that, that we're looking for? Uh, uh, will this get us to where, we, where we're trying to, trying to get to? So uh, one thing that is happening as a result of the conversation is that um, it's going to cause us, I think, as a community to, to think about looking at addressing community safety in a different way. Uh, we have too many people in the community who see community safety as just the job of Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department, but it is bigger than that. Right. Uh, it is actually the job of the Charlotte Mecklenburg uh, community safety is the job of the uh, police department and the community actually working together. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and that is all aspects of, of the community, from the folk who work in the tall buildings downtown, uh, to inner city neighborhoods, to schools, to churches. It's, it has to be a, a truly a comprehensive approach. Uh, as you all are providing suggestions and ideas to us that we might add to this process, uh, you might want to start to think about uh, what are some of the things that we're currently doing that we need to keep doing because they are being they are successful and they're going to lead us mm -hmm. to where we want to get. Uh, what are some things that we're currently doing that we probably should stop doing because mm -hmm. there are some programs that are out there that sound good and that are not that successful. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, uh, what are some programs or, or some things that we are currently not doing that we need to start doing? Right. That's right. And so that's what we would, uh, especially on that third component, is what we need some of the suggestions and ideas up from you all. Mm -hmm. So again, I'll, I'll start off by asking, as you look at this sheet here, are we on the right path? Are we? Uh, 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 what is it that we? Uh, what is it that you all want to measure, and how are you going to measure it? If I get back to Councilman Braxton's, Braxton's uh, point, Mr. Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, so, Mr. Rashford, I think for me, you touched on one big key component: that's community involvement. I think we have to have community buy-in and own this as well as with the city. So I'm excited we got increased community capacity. Mm -hmm. And I do think that can go a long way. Um, I do think the assessment of city programs will, will be huge for us because right. I think that sometimes we just get caught up in the title. Right. And we have not looked at those programs for years and years and years because it sounds good. Mm -hmm. right. And so, uh, and, and then the third, Rebecca, you did touch on what other cities that we had looked at, the Oakland and Chicago. I do think taking those best practices, and to your point, what are they doing that we can incorporate? But here's the big one for me, and, and Chief, thank you for the strategy session. You show the hot spots. I think what I like to see, too, is data broke down per age group and let us make sure we can target it on one group we're really trying to, to reach. Because let's face it, we, even the community, we can't be all things to all people. Absolutely. But if we can show success that we're going to target those 15 and 16-year-olds, right now, and so when we measure this two or three years, no crime, in school, uh, employed. employed. I think we can all say that we did something right. So I, I, I don't want us to just throw out the big net and say we're going to take care of the 25-year-old as well as the 15-year-old. I think we have to be sensitive to all, but I think that data will help us drive what target we can make a difference. Um, and I think Mr. Mitchell just outline a couple of things that I'd like to see us kind of explicitly list among our expected outcomes, which is I think we need to have, I mean, we have some outcomes here, community outcomes, but I think we need to have outcomes for individuals too. And I don't, I don't see anything here that says the things that Mr. Mitchell just listed, which is, um, you know, and again, pick your target. I think based on the data we have seen, it's maybe 15 to 25 year olds or somewhere in that ballpark. Um, increase in 15 to 25 year old uh, high school completion rate, mm -hmm. increase in 15 to 25 mm -hmm. year old employment rate. There you go. In, mm -hmm. Right, and so yeah. I think as outcomes, and maybe, maybe it doesn't have to be that specific, but it could be something that is more individually focused than just these 
larger, you know, violence reduction, healthier neighborhoods ag agreed on all those points. I, I do think, too, and I, I'll ask, um, ask Ms. Hazel and Ms. Hefner, how would you define increased community capacity in, in this expected outcome? I could help. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Or you can phone a friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, what we found, um, especially in the area of Jumpstart, is the young people who are um, trained, um, inspired, and ready to lead efforts like this because there's a handful that we can all name, but we got to expand it beyond that. So capacity means there are a lot more names added to that list. And to your point, I think the four um, building blocks here, um, it might not hurt if there were time giving specific examples underneath those that uh, would, would you, you spoke of a couple of uh, data points that I think would be good data points under the use of data and evidence around 15 to 25 year olds, the graduation rate changing, increasing, um, the employment opportunities increasing that we intentionally measure that specifically. Right now, a lot of it is anecdotal, and it's not as evidence-based as we want it to be yet, but that's why we're here today talking about the starting point. I think some of those categories would be underneath those four buildings. And that list you're talking about is the Greg Jackson, the Sean Corbett's of the world, and saying, how do we identify yes, more of those people to... Ms. Ajmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So as we are doing thorough assessments of all our programs, we also have to keep in mind that there would be some programs where it requires longer term, to your chief, chief, your point, where we may not be able to assess them. So that's where we have to rely on best practices, because if it requires five, ten years down the road to assess the program, I don't want us to just write off the program uh, if we can't assess it. So there's got to be a combination, combined approach, where we are looking at assessments, but at the same time we are looking at best practices and not eliminating programs that could potentially help and deliver results five years, ten years down the road. Uh, so I, I see this more of a, a policy and programs combined approach where we have to look at our existing programs but also the policies uh, and, and this is going to require some sort of piloting, uh, the way I look at this, a pilot phase where uh, here are some programs, let's pilot and see if it's giving us the results or um, that we are looking for. And if that does, then we might have to look at the policy and see how we can modify the policy to inc uh, have broader outreach. Uh, so I think, uh, that requires flexibility from council to make sure we are providing resources and tools to you in terms of here are some of the pilot programs that you can implement um, that we may not have done in the past. One thing to note on the community capacity piece with the Jumpstart <coughs> grant, I think that's a good example. So Jumpstart grant started looked at how it could even be expanded, expanded both through the budgeting process the second year around, how even within that program, you could really focus on how you're increasing the capacity of the individual organizations right. to um, go out and seek out funding from other sources. So, so I think that's a really good example of how even within one new program and focusing on that one box, specifically community-led, Right. Um, we were looking at how we continue to build on that um, and make it even stronger. And then drilling down into the, you know, from, the, from there, this use of data and evidence is that the charge would be to be, you know, identifying what are our, what are, what are our interim things we can measure, even if we don't know yet if this youth in a program mm -hmm. is, you know, what what their outcomes are going to be in five years? What do you measure? Uh, what do you measure immediately? What do you measure intermediate? Right. And what are you looking at long term? So at the you know, at the granular level, um, you know, from a program evaluation lens, we would map all of that out based on you know, the framework and guidance we get. And and just to follow up, Mr. Chairman, I I think we got to have some sort of a roadmap. Here are the short term actions that we're going mm -hmm. to take. Right, two, three, four months. Here are uh, midterm steps we are going to take. That's uh, we have a plan, 
and then long-term plan that here is what we have to do two years, five years down the road. So we, we have some sort of plan in place for addressing violence. Um, and I don't know if we have anything like that. If Do we, any framework where it sorts of gives us some sort of directions uh, where we are not uh, testing every couple of years uh, where we got to have some sort of framework. We are creating it as you speak. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, yes. Mr. Winston. So I, I keep, again, I'm, I'm, I think there's a box missing in here, and I think the box is us as elected officials, as the ones that are, you know, at, 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 at the, the top of the umbrella. Um, we need a charge in terms of how we approach this. Again, we can come up with a framework to give CMPD or Housing and Neighborhood Services guidance of how to, to use their budgets and work with Sean Corbett's and the Greg um, uh, uh, Jacksons and every, everybody like that. But again, we are, we are not figuring out how to change the system, right? We're dealing with, still dealing with our point in the criminal justice system, for instance, or, or the interruption of violence cycle. Um, we need the data, for instance, from um, not just the DA, but the, the public defender's office, right? I had a conversation with uh, Mr. Tully, and he is saying that, you know, if he could get another social worker in there, he can do some of this work for us, right, to, to keep people from, 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 from coming back to him. Talking to the district attorney, um, there's no civil bullet there, but if we could advocate to help change their, um, uh, the way they have to retain records, you know, and they, the way they can use more of those resources, you know, that are already within their organization to do um, uh, different things right now. I think we, again, we have to have a charge where we're, where we are uh, um, uh, uh, focusing on changing the in, entire system and we are charged with going out and doing the work with other bodies to make that happen. When we talk about schools, we can't just talk about, you know, for instance, um, uh, what CMS is going to do, but how are we diving down into those individual teachers, you know, who know, can bring us some of the uh, quant qualitative evidence, you know, about what can change in, this, in, in, in areas by bringing the different, different, different entities together to fix the park, to fix the, the 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 sidewalks to 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 whatever it may be and bringing all of those resources together into those places but that is going to come from us um, talking to our other counterparts yeah. to, to change those systems I think part of what you said Mike could fit in the box community collaborative approach in priority areas but maybe we could break that out too and say interagency uh, collaboration as well as you know systemic if we don't have any expectation that we have to work together with our, yeah. our counterparts, where it just becomes, oh, maybe I, we should do this and, and take it, on, 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 you know, the, it, the, you know, because because I want to do it, you know, for the folks that are coming three councils from now, they should be an expectation that they have to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Systems in place that that live on beyond the council members that are sitting here today. Right. So I think the however you want to phrase that, something around systemic changes that we might deem necessary internally or externally and and also that interagency collaborative approach we could do everything right at our point in the system but if we're not bringing others along we're actually not changing Breaks down yeah. yeah miss johnson no that's okay i'm i'm good you good <laughs> he, did, he, did he steal your idea no, that's okay <laughs> good, great point yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that uh, what, I, what I'm hearing you say is uh, that we need, uh, it, it's about intentionality. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, we, we've talked about um, the, the need to work with uh, the county and other components in the community uh, to get our work done, but we haven't taken the next step, and that is being intentional about bringing them to the table, so that, that that's going to be important. Yeah. There's just also, honestly, there's also a big difference when we say staffs, y'all have to work together yeah. as opposed to Council. Us as 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 electeds that are coming together, and and making it again happen within our our our, our systems. Because if 
look, I'll, I'll be honest. I've been trying to get a, a, a meeting with the, the CMS superintendent, and it's impossible because he's protected by his board. So I need to go, and we need to go and work to the board. So if we want to do anything with, you know, with the staff of CMS, we have to collaborate with the school board. That doesn't happen. It's, it's strange for council members to set meetings with school board members, and that shouldn't be the case. So, so as, as we were speaking earlier in a meeting before we came here, we, we talked about uh, all of us understanding uh, that no one of us is as good as all of us. And so it means bringing everybody to the table. Uh, uh, Councilman Ashmiro, you had asked a question earlier about the difference between uh, an evidence-based program evidence -based. versus a uh, best practice. Uh, an evidence-based program, um, if, if thought out well, uh, has a universal quality and should work in most communities. Uh, best practices, because it is a best practice uh, in, in, in Dallas, Texas, right. doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a best practice here right. in Charlotte because the factors may be different. Right. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't look at it. Right. So we have about 20 minutes before we're scheduled to wrap, and I know people have stuff on the back end of this meeting, so we want to be respectful of your time. Mr. Ashford, where do you, where would you like to see us get to before, and I'd like to leave five minutes in so we can approve our calendar and get any other um, announcements or anything anybody needs to make, but where do you think for us to have an effective framework conversation on February 4th that we need to get to today before we, uh, before we wrap? I think before the end, we, we you need to consider adoption of these four building blocks uh, as, as the foundation for doing uh, this work to reduce violence in the community. So, Ms. Hazel, Ms. Hefner, would you all, based on Mr. Winston's comments and, and the idea of, do you think that interagency collaboration and systemic changes, do you think those fit into something that we have here, or do you think those need to be broken out as separate building blocks, or? So I think part of it is that the systemic change is really the umbrella. And so you would you would potentially say, you know, where where we have this yet? goal statement at the top, city, county, partners and community work together, that can that can be a a block that really highlights what what do we mean by that? There's an expectation of um, Partner, partnership, interagency collaboration, and and the expectation that that is both elected and staff um, responsibility. And then two in our outcomes, how do you think in terms of making sure that we're clear about what the objectives are, how do you think we most clearly can state some of what uh, Mr. Mitchell outlined around the, the, out, the measurable outcomes in this framework, not just being the broader community outcomes, but the more individually tailored outcomes for the most at-risk people. How, how do we best state that clearly, do you think? I think the individual outcomes would be collective outcomes that we're looking for at the program level, and then at the and, the, and then you also have kind of community indicators that you're broadly tracking and monitoring that you might say, uh, together as a community, we're aiming for these big goals around maybe it's high school graduation or you know some of the things that that would come out of our partnerships and those systemic changes. And then you would also identify measures at the program level for the population that's being worked with, um, so that you can track the effectiveness of the program. And there may be you know we could think about it a little bit between now and the next meeting, but there might be a better way to demonstrate that um, as like the underpinning uh, foundational element of all of the building blocks um, based on this conversation. Because I'm, I'm agnostic to how we phrase it, but I, I think somewhere there needs to be that indication of that one of our major outcomes is we want to see increased increase the metrics on employment and education for our most at-risk individuals in our community. And if that's 15 to 25-year-old African-American males who come from a single-parent family or whatever, however specific or broad we want to get, um, I think that's an important thing to, to outline explicitly. That's what I see is, is our next step. If we have agreement on 
the four blocks. Then we come back and and um, bring back what are those expected outcomes and the metrics associated with them so that we look at the 15 to 25 year age group, the high school employment, all those things that were named earlier. That's an example of something we would do. It seems like staff needs to do some work to maybe come back with recommendation for you all to review. Um, yeah. Ms. Johnson, but before that, is there anything else that y'all can tell us you feel like you need from us today to be as prepared as possible for the February 4th meeting? I mean, I, I think this has been a really valuable conversation, so. Ms. Johnson. I think you had stepped out of the room when I talked about this earlier, but is it possible to invite someone from the county and from the school board to be a part of the committee? So in terms of being like a voting committee member, that the committees are just comprised of city council members, but, un, but certainly, and again, we have someone from the county. I'd love to have somebody from CMS here. So if we can, I mean, and maybe our, well, some people have left. Um, we're here. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think we can, and I'm happy to to speak with the school board chair and say who is the right person to have at the table from the school system that can know what we're doing and can make sure that we're aware of what they're doing. Or even intentionally as a subject matter expert to be a part of the meeting, maybe not a voting member, but a part of the team. And I know we have the intergovernmental t committee, but I think a lot of the issues that affect the city are intergovernmental. So if we could do that, I just think that would be a good idea. Mr. Wilson. So uh, Mr. Chairman Eggleston is on the intergovernmental committee um, and we met yesterday for the first time and something that uh, um, Mr. Bakari and I um, agree on, I don't necessarily want to speak for him, um, but we need an intergovernmental approach to basically all of our work, That's right. you know, and um, I think uh, that that's something we're going to try to um, wrestle with in terms of how, how do we employ that in a practice um, through our committee over this next year. Um, but I will say to that point, um, uh, myself and Mr. Bakari are scheduled to meet with uh, Ms. Dashu um, and Ms. Marshall, who is their intergovernmental committee person um, in the coming week. So if there's anything that you uh, feel that we should um, be uh, 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 talking about specific to this committee or in general, I would encourage you to reach out to Mr. Eggleston or, or Mr. Bakari and myself, and uh, we can take that into consideration and, and keep and, building on that. And I think the low hanging fruit, and, and there might be more than this, and, and that we can have those conversations offline, but the low hanging fruit is have them identify who is the most logical person from CMS um, that we can send this meeting schedules to and, and ask them to be here or send a proxy because. Undoubtedly, they have somebody whose main focus is the safety of their students um, and identifying at-risk students. And if that's the right person to be here, then, then they need to be in the room. And I was glad to see that we, we had folks from the county. And, yeah. and I'd ask Ms. Charles, too, that if from the manager's office side of it, if we can work through um, uh, Superintendent Winston or county uh, manager Diorio and and make that same ask that maybe uh, we'll make from an elected level that you're at, you're making it from a management level to say here is the sch schedule for our meetings and we really want this to be collaborative and for it to be please make sure that you've got the right person in the room um, does anybody else have anything I, I do want to, us to formally while we still have three voting members. Mr. Mitchell had an 1145 meeting he had to get to. So before we lose a quorum, did anybody see anything problematic on the meeting calendar? And if not, would anyone care to make a motion to formally approve that meeting calendar? Motion to approve. A second. Wonderful. Oh, everyone in, uh, in support? Aye. Aye. Okay. All right. We have a meeting calendar, Ms. Charles. Yeah, I'm so glad. I, I knew Ms. Ashmera would be busy on the first Tuesday of March, so we'll uh, we'll reschedule that meeting as necessary. Yeah. She'll have a 14-hour workday that day That's at the polls. 24, 26 hours a day. 26 hours a day. <laughs> um, I don't think the polls are open quite that long. <laughs> so, um, are there any other final comments anybody wants to make? I appreciate all of the the staff assistants. Appreciate all of our guests for joining us. Is there anything else y'all need from us, or anything else that we need from staff that hasn't been? Stated or outlined? If not, I'll 
entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Great. Second. All right. Thank you very much. I did it all. Uh, thank you. Second adjourn motion.